Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. John Glasser is up next, but first, more news. There is some disagreement among the bishops over a recent Supreme Court decision. Bishop Thomas Poprocki of Springfield, Illinois, took issue with the U.S. Bishops' Conference rejection of a court decision that ruled that public sector employees cannot be required to pay union dues. The U.S. bishops lamented the decision, citing the long-held view of so many bishops in support of labor unions. The U.S. Bishops' Conference went so far as to submit a friend of the court brief in support of the union that was being sued. But Bishop Paprocki issued a dissent from the conference's opinion in a video statement saying unions should not expect the unquestioning support of the church when their objectives are contrary to the person's religious and moral duties. Forcing public employees to subsidize unions that promote such immoral policies and activities is just not right. It is encouraging that the U.S. Supreme Court ruling in Janus v. AFSCME upholds the right to be free from coercion in speech. As Pope St. John Paul II said, God's law does not reduce, much less do away with human freedom. The head of Pope Francis' super dicastery for the laity, family, and life is taking a little heat for saying priests are not the best people to prepare couples for marriage. In an interview with an Irish Catholic publication, Cardinal Kevin Farrell, the former Bishop of Dallas, spoke of the need for the church to rely on the laity for pastoral tasks because of the sheer numbers of those needing help, namely marriage counseling and preparation. Fair enough. But from there, he appeared to question the ability of the priests themselves. Farrell said, with regard to marriage, priests, quote, have no credibility, they have never lived the experience, they may know moral theology, dogmatic theology in theory, but to go from there to putting it into practice every day, they don't have the experience. Cardinal Farrell made a similar comment last year. Among those who have criticized the Vatican prefect for his point of view was Bishop Thomas Tobin of Providence. He tweeted this week, It seems fair to ask then if a celibate cleric has sufficient credibility to lead a dicastery devoted to laity, family, and life. Meanwhile, the media's sound and fury over President Trump's bluster at the NATO summit has come and gone. When he arrived in Brussels, Trump repeated his call for some member nations to pay their fair share toward the military alliance. He further called out Germany for being a captive to Russia because of a multi-billion dollar gas line deal. Ultimately, NATO resolved to develop new plans for its defense against Russia and terrorism. Now for analysis of the NATO summit and a preview of the president's meeting with Vladimir Putin is Director of Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute, John Glasser. John, thanks for being here. Pleasure. Uh, I want to play something for you. This is from the presser today at NATO. The president was asked about Putin, and he put it this way. Well, he's a competitor. He's been very nice to me the times I've met him. I've been nice to him. He's a competitor. You know, somebody was saying, is he an enemy? No, he's not my enemy. Is he a friend? No, I don't know him well enough. But the couple of times that I've gotten to meet him, we got along very well. You saw that. Um, I hope we get along well. I think we get along well. Uh, but ultimately, he's a competitor. He's representing Russia. I'm representing the United States. What do you make of that? Well, it's a lot of uh, words without yeah, much meaning. Right. Um, but I think it does indicate Trump's tendency to view the world in personal relationships as opposed mm -hmm. to uh, competing national strategies. And what do you expect to come from this meeting? I mean, Trump does place a lot of emphasis on that personal yeah. relationship and camaraderie. I mean, gosh, when he and Macron were meeting here in Washington, I thought they were going to get a room. And now you, you see him setting up a similar thing here. What's the end goal for the United States? Well, there's lots of things that we could try to accomplish in a meeting with Putin. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the New START Treaty that was signed under the Obama administration that caps our long-range nuclear uh, uh, forces, are uh, that's a solid treaty that Russia wants to extend. They've expressed interest in doing that. Mm -hmm. It expires in 2021. We could 
we could work on extending that. Uh, there's a lot of things to do with regard to Syria. Uh, Russia's military presence in Syria, unlike ours, is actually legal. They have the permission of the host government there. They can help on counterterrorism. Uh, they, can, they can help stabilize the Assad regime. They can help rebuild some of the destruction now that things are dying down. Um, on North Korea, if Trump wants to continue to have some kind of maximum pressure policy and keep up sanctions before he sees some kind of movement on denuclearization from Pyongyang, he's going to need Russia's cooperation on that as well. Mm -hmm. So there's plenty of substance to talk about. Yeah. Whether or not they'll get to any of that, yeah, I'm the, not quite the sure. The president says is, there's not a big agenda here. Yeah. There's not a big agenda. It seems there's a huge agenda. I mean, I, so I, I wonder why this, uh, the downplaying, is that to downplay expectations of what might come of this? It might be to downplay expectations, but it's also to try to counter the extremely high temperature that U.S.-Russia mm -hmm. relations are in right now, mm -hmm. uh, domestically in the United States at least. Right. So, for example, there's a lot of questions about whether or not Trump is going to, quote-unquote, recognize uh, Russia's annexation of Crimea mm -hmm. or try to lift sanctions that are associated with that move. Um, I don't I doubt that'll happen, it, but, you know, yeah. Trump, who, well, who knows? Putin, Putin has taken Crimea off the table, right? That's yeah. not part of the discussions. There is no possible way that Putin is going to walk back what happened in Crimea any more that Israel is going to start to give yeah, back the Golan Heights or anything mm -hmm. like this. That territory is now Russia's, and no amount of sanctions or browbeating from the United States is going to reverse it. The other point of controversy here, of course, is Russian meddling in the 2016 election, mm. which Trump has been reluctant. Uh, well, he much, said he'd bring it up. He said he'd bring it up, but he's been reluctant to believe the assessment of the U.S. intelligence community, mm -hmm. much to the chagrin of many in his cabinet and on Capitol Hill. Um, but, you know, again, bringing it up there is probably not going to add very much. Uh, cyber offensive cyber operations and retaliations are probably just going to mm -hmm. escalate things unnecessarily. Yeah. And so you're right that uh, not much might be able to be accomplished at this meeting. Hmm. Uh, the thing that I find curious is, though the president is not going to be discussing Crimea at all, the fact is NATO continues to defend the Ukrainian forces there that are pushing back against uh, Putin. Uh, we have heavy sanctions that continue to be uh, placed upon Russia for this action. That's not that hasn't been moved in the least under Trump. He's, in fact, he's pushed forward and continued those sanctions. No, you're right. And, it, and it's, it's a good point to make because there's a lot of uh, consternation in the establishment in Washington mm -hmm. about Trump's kind of... Uh, Coddling Russia. We heard it today from Nancy Pelosi that uh, he's cozying up to, to Putin to the detriment of NATO. Right. Not Do you only, see it that way? Well, no. I mean, not only... Yeah, the criticism is that he's cozying up to, mm -hmm. to Russia, but also berating NATO allies. But mm -hmm. policy hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. We, in last April, we invited uh, the 29th member of, of NATO, Montenegro. Mm. Uh, we might be doing the same thing with Macedonia now. Mm. So NATO is continuing to expand, which is exactly the opposite of Trump's kind of NATO is obsolete right. rhetoric. And it's exactly what Trump, what Putin does not want. We're uh, doubling down on uh, delivery of lethal weapons to Ukraine to fight Russian separatist groups mm -hmm. uh, in, in the east. Um, we're doing uh, military exercises in the Baltics. I mean, policy-wise, we're just as hard on Russia as we always have been, it seems to me. Mm -hmm. well, Putin wants those, those military exercises in the Baltics to stop. Do you Definitely. see that happening? Or Trump caving on that? Well, he's going to face a lot of internal resistance to a move like that. Not only is Secretary Mattis kind of reaffirming the importance of NATO and these kinds of military exercises, but... Um, you know, the, the, the rest of the allies definitely support them. So it'd be very, it'd be an uphill battle for Trump to promise something like that. So what do you think he is looking for from Vladimir Putin in this meeting? What do you think is the agenda here for the United States or the must-do agenda items? Well, the problem is that I don't think there is much of an mm -hmm. agenda. So, for example, uh, the same with the Kim summit, the, mm -hmm. the summit mm -hmm. with North Korea. Trump is a lot about stagecraft and not that much about statecraft. Uh, he doesn't dig down into the issues. He doesn't have a granular understanding or knowledge of the specific policy or strategic issues at play. He loves the pageantry of diplomacy. He loves meeting with uh, big players in the international community. And he loves kind of sticking it in the craw of uh, the rest of establishment Washington. And mm -hmm. that was the case with the meeting with Kim Jong-un, and it's going to be the case with Vladimir Putin. Mm -hmm. Well, but different from, the, just to take a little issue with what you said, 
at NATO, he seems to have burrowed down to the granular uh, in, in these fees that the, the NATO allies are paying. He says the United States is, is, has this burden. We've been carrying it. We're not going to do it anymore. Here he is at NATO. Watch. I told people that I'd be very unhappy if they didn't up their commitments very substantially because the United States has been paying a tremendous amount, probably 90 percent of the cost of NATO. But yesterday, uh, I let them know that I was extremely unhappy with what was happening, and uh, they have substantially upped their commitment. Yeah. And now we're very happy and uh, have a very, very powerful, very, very strong NATO, much stronger than it was two days ago. Your reaction? Well, Trump is exactly right to say that there's a burden-sharing problem with NATO. Presidents going all the way back to Dwight Eisenhower have complained about that. It's been a long-standing problem. Mm -hmm. But I will note that he seems to not understand the actual mechanism of how this works. Mm -hmm. In his complaints about it, he talks about some, he seems to indicate that there's some fund out there that we all contribute to a NATO fund and, you know, uh, other members owe us back dues and all this kind of thing. That's not how it works. Mm -hmm. Countries pay for their own security, their own defense budgets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was a commitment in the Obama administration for all NATO member countries by 2024 to reach 2 percent of GDP in right. their military spending. Um, and they haven't done that. That's totally true. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's a couple of strange problems with this complaint about NATO burden, burden sharing and European uh, spending on defense. Um, the first thing is that Part of the idea behind NATO, the original purpose of it, was to incentivize European countries to underspend on defense. That was the mm -hmm. idea of it. So to complain about it, even though that's the strategy as it originated, is a little strange. The other problem is that this arbitrary emphasis on 2% of GDP doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, countries shouldn't arbitrarily pick a percentage of their GDP of what to spend on defense. They should look at their interests, they should look at the threats that they face, and make their decision about spending to accommodate that. You know, some people say they're underspending on defense, but I'm not quite sure that's true. They well, the really truth is the United States is overspending in that's NATO. That's exactly that's right. The, that's and, the reality. And if Trump wants NATO countries to spend more, there's a simple way to do that. We spend less. Mm -hmm. But he did the opposite. He mm -hmm. campaigned on greater military budgets, and he passed mil uh, higher military budgets. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure where. So you would be for from. the United States spending less in NATO? Absolutely. I mean, we've spent in the past 30 years mm -hmm. about 15 trillion dollars on our military. That far exceeds what any other country has mm -hmm. spent by a long shot. Mm -hmm. uh, part of the reason is that we have to we have to spend enough to have a big enough military to fulfill all of the commitments that we have. And we're extended all over the world. And we're treaty bound to com, yeah. you know defend about 60 or 70 nations. Yeah, Ike also wanted those troops back home, and he thought they would be home in what 12 years from the start of NATO. Or something. Right. Like that. They're still there. Um, what do you make of his argument? And, and we'll play a little clip of that as I talk about it. That when he, he yelled across the table at the breakfast the other day to uh, the Allies saying Germany is basically ruled by Russia because of that Nord Stream uh, pipeline, now a second one uh, being contemplated, being built. Uh, does he have a point that Germany is undermining the alliance by doing a side energy deal with Russia, who controls the spigots? Well, look, I think it's true that Germany in this context, there's a tension between its security and economic interests and its kind of normative and ideological commitments. Mm -hmm. So it wants to stand up to Russia, uh, especially about its actions in Ukraine and, and the Crimea. And they really have been at the forefront of criticizing Russia and standing up mm -hmm. to Putin. On the other hand, it's in their economic and security interest to get cheap uh, yeah, energy. Cheap, cheap, uh, it's gas. going right from Russia's shores under the Baltic Sea mm -hmm. right to Germany's shores. And that's really cheap and easy for them. And so, you know, I don't, I, it's not really fair to, to badger them over this. Uh, it's not clear that they're under the control of Russia or captive by, of Russia. You know, I think that was a kind of overstatement. By well, Trump. they could be, though. I mean, down the, just as a strategic weapon that Putin could use, he has done this before to Ukraine by cutting off the energy, right? Sure. To weaken them. But look, if you look at the whole thing, uh, the European spending on defense is about is is an order of magnitude what Russia spends. Russian military spending is roughly the same as uh, the, the Russian GDP mm -hmm. is roughly the same as Spain's. 
-hmm. They're a pretty weak economy. They have all kinds of demographic problems, mm -hmm. problems with corruption, things that are dragging down the economy. Their ability to project power and represent a really grave threat to Europe is pretty limited. And limited. Uh, before I let you go, let's talk for a moment about this uh, quickie meeting with Theresa May, the drive-by with the Queen at Windsor Castle. What is the president going to accomplish here? Um, I know Theresa May's government is in some flux now. Two of her big cabinet officials resigned right. during the week over this Brexit deal that they've been working on for years. Right. Where does this lead Brexit and what can the president achieve here, if anything? So I think that's a lot of politics and not much policy. Mm -hmm. Britain's trying to figure out how to comply with their population's decision in the mm -hmm. referendum and it's causing a lot of destabilization in Theresa May's uh, administration. Uh, you know, it's it, Trump likes the Brexit thing. He thinks it was part of his campaign. Mm -hmm. He feels some camaraderie with that kind of vote. Uh, and he's going to try to play it up for pol political reasons, but not much to be done on policy. On policy. John Gleiser, thank you so much for being here Thanks. at the Cato Institute. And you can follow John's commentary at Cato.org.